In this short video, we're going to introduce some terminology regarding linear systems. Now, we've already seen and had to solve many linear systems in different contexts. For example, in one of the first things we saw when we were learning about adding vectors graphically was that we could actually determine the exact coefficients needed on each vector in order to reach a particular position vector. We also had to solve a system of equation when we were given two non-parallel planes and we were trying to find a point which lies on both planes. And then the classic example of given a set of vectors determine if a additional vector actually belongs to the span of those vectors. And remember that's equivalent to saying is there a linear combination which will generate the vector w. Now it's difficult to overemphasize the importance of solving linear systems both practically or in applications and also for just understanding more about the mathematics behind all of these concepts. Uh, but certainly in terms of applications it is probably one of the most if not the most important applications in computational mathematics. It's used everywhere and because of that there are dozens of algorithms available. We're going to learn one and a modification of it but just bear in mind that there are people who have made their careers, who have founded companies based on developing a new algorithm for solving a linear system. Now which algorithm is going to be used depends on many factors. For example, the number of unknowns. So uh, systems with 50 million uh, variables or 50 million unknowns are quite common today um, and you know within two or three years hundreds of millions of unknowns will be common and people have already solved systems of equations with over a billion unknowns. Uh, but it also depends on the physics behind the system of equations. Uh, some algorithms are more adequate than others. Uh, the type of hardware that you have and the accuracy of the solution. If you just need an approximation then you have more options. And finally the analysis steps which come before and after the solution of the linear systems. And the idea is that depending on the algorithm you choose you may be able to reuse some of the information and that even though it's more costly to compute that information in the long run you may save a lot of time and effort. So solving a linear system efficiently is one of the most challenging uh, computational mathematical problems. So let's see how we can represent a typical linear system uh, using something called a matrix. So here we're given three vectors, v1, v2, v3, and a fourth vector, b. All of these live in R4, and we'd like to know if the vector b is in the span of v1, v2, v3. In other words, we'd like to know, can I find a linear combination of v1, v2, and v3 such that that linear combination equals the vector b. So I can go ahead and uh, put in the components for v1, v2, v3, and the vector b. And I can get this vector equation which I can then write the left hand side as a single vector. And our next step would be to equate the corresponding components from each side and that gives me a system of equations. Now 
the way I've written the system of equations is it's very structured. So I put x1 first, then x2, then x3, then the right-hand side, or the b vector, right there. And if I'm very careful about maintaining that structure, I don't need to write down the x1, x2, x3. I don't need to write down the equal sign. And I don't even need to be concerned about uh, the plus or the minus. I'll just have the plus or the minus in the coefficient. So instead of having x1, I know it's 1x1 here. Negative x2, I put a negative 1 here because that's a negative 1x2 and so on. So the first uh, column is going to represent x1, the second column is x2, and the third column is x3, the last column is the uh, right-hand side, or the constant. Uh, so th this is a rectangular array. We call it a matrix, and it's a special kind of matrix. We call it an augmented matrix. So again, first column corresponds to x1. The second column corresponds to x2. Third column corresponds to x3. And when I say corresponds, it means that these are the coefficients on the x3 variable in that equation. So if I look at the third equation here, that would read as x1 plus 2x2 plus 0x3 equals 1. So I do have to have that 0 in there as a placeholder, even though in the equation there is no x3 variable. And then this last column represents the constants of the right-hand side. So if I only focus on the coefficients, so the first column being the coefficients on x1, the second column the coefficients on x2, the third column are the coefficients on x3, then I call that matrix the coefficient matrix. We have a lot of vocabulary in this class, but these particular matrix names are easy to remember because they're very descriptive. And likewise, if we make the uh, right-hand side into its own matrix, of course there's only one column because we only have one right-hand side, we call it the right-hand side matrix. And then only when we put them together, we have the coefficient matrix and then the right-hand side matrix appended to it. That's what we call the augmented matrix. Now, we can leave out that dashed line separating the coefficient matrix from the right-hand side matrix when it's clear that there's only one right-hand side column there. And so let's just go over some of the terminology about matrices. They have rows and columns and an individual number in the matrix is called an entry. So this 2 here is called the 3, 2 entry because it's in the third row and the second column. So whenever we uh, want to express something about entries or matrices, we always do rows first, then columns. So it's the 3, 2 entry means the third row and the second column. We use uppercase letters to represent matrices. And then we use the corresponding lowercase letter with a double subscript for an individual entry. And again, in the double subscript, the first subscript tells me the row, and the second subscript tells me the column. So this two I would write as lowercase a32, and I would say a32 equals 2. So again, a couple more examples, say uh, 
I would write that, say, A11 equals 1, A31, so that would be the third row, first column is 1, and then I could also say that uh, A34 equals 0. All right, that would be the third row, fourth column. That would be my zero. We have a, this idea of the size of a matrix. We call it the order. And we talk about the order in terms of the number of rows by the number of columns. And we use this little um, multiplication sign, but it's not really multiplication, it's just part of the notation. So the order of the matrix uh, that we've been using as an example is 4 by 4, because it's 4 rows by 4 columns. So even though we write 4x4, say it's a 4 by 4 matrix, we pronounce the x as by. So 4 by 4 matrix. So in an augmented matrix, or in a coefficient matrix, the number of rows tells us the number of equations. So each row represents an equation in an augmented matrix. For the coefficient matrix, or the coefficient part of the augmented matrix, the columns uh, correspond to the number of variables. So just by looking at an augmented matrix, you can see how many equations were in the system and how many variables were in the system. So let's go back the other way. Here we're given in an augmented matrix. Let's write down the corresponding system of equations. So again, The first column corresponds to x1, so the only the first equation has an x1 term. All of the other coefficients are 0. So I've got x1 plus 2x2 minus x3 equals 3. And then the second equation would be x2 minus 2x3 equals negative 4. And the third equation is x3 equals 2. And the fourth equation is just 0 equals 0. Now, this particular structure of a system of equations is really easy to solve, and we use this technique called back substitution. So let's go through this. The 0 equals 0 is a true statement, but it doesn't give us any information about the uh, solution of this particular system of equation. But I am given that x3 equals 2. So now what I can do is take that value and substitute it back into the equation above it. And so then I'll get x2 minus 2 x3, which is 2 equals negative 4, or uh, that tells me x2 minus 4 equals negative 4. And that tells me then that x2 equals 0. So now the idea would be take your value of x3 and the value of, oops, x2 that you just calculated and put that in the equation above them, which is the only other equation that's left. And that gives me x1 plus 2 times x2, which is 0, minus x3, and x3 is 2, will equal 3. And so uh, that's going to say then, make sure I've got that right, that um, x1 has to equal 
And so it's called back substitution because it's very descriptive. You start from the bottom and work your way back, and at each time you can substitute a known value or several known values into the equation above and find the new variable value. So we saw that if we had a, uh, an augmented matrix which had this special structure, uh, it was very easy to uh, solve the corresponding system. And the question is, well, what made it so easy? Well, any row of all zeros was at the bottom. It's not really contributing to the uh, value of any of the variables. It's at the bottom, it's out of the way. We know that when we're trying to find the solution, we can just simply ignore it. Then the first non-zero entry in each row is a one. If we go back and look at our solution steps here, there was no division required because we just had 1x2, 1x1, 1x3. No division was required in order to find the values of the variables. And then, uh, by the way, these ones are called leading ones. That is the one first non-zero entry when it's a 1 is called a leading one. And then any entry below a leading one is zero. In each column there, all of the entries below the leading one are zero. And that kind of allows us to work our way backwards there, because in the third row, I only have to worry about x3. Now I know x3, and so in the second row, I only have to worry about finding x2. And then in the first row, I only need to find x1. And so these leading ones, as you go down, they get moved to the right. So this special structure is called row echelon form, or just REF. We will write REF over and over again. Uh, and so we're going to remember row echelon form. Echelon is a word for staircase, because you can see that one way of thinking about it is that the zeros, you step down. Or you could think about it in terms of the leading ones forming kind of a staircase there. So it's a descriptive term. It's just an unusual uh, word for staircase, echelon row echelon form. So what are the properties of a matrix in row echelon form? Well, it's the properties that make it useful for solving an augmented sy system of equations, which would be that any rows of all zeros are at the bottom. The first non-zero entry in each row is 1, called a, a leading 1. And then if the next row going down is non-zero, then its leading one is to the right of all the leading ones above it. So those were the properties that made it useful. Now, we can actually go a step further um, and get what we call reduced row echelon form. So you start off with something in row echelon form, and then you have this additional property that not only are the numbers in the column below the leading one zero, but the numbers above the leading ones are zero as well. So let's look at a matrix in row echelon form versus reduced row echelon form. And so in reduced row echelon form, uh, again, here's our leading one. Every number above it in that column is zero. Same thing with this one every number above it and below it is 0. Uh, and if we're talking about an aug augmented matrix, then 
a matrix in reduced row echelon form has the very, very simple structure. In fact, it reveals the solutions. It shows us that x1 equals 7, x2 equals 0, and x3 equals 2. Okay, so let me emphasize important properties about our row echelon form, which you've already mentioned. So column J corresponds to the variable X sub J. Obviously, when you get to the uh, last column, that's your right-hand side. If column J has a leading one, so we're going to see an example where not every column has a leading one. The example that we saw previously, every column had a leading one, but it's possible that not every column has a leading one. And it, but if it does, it's called a leading column, and the corresponding variable is called a leading variable. On the other hand, if a column does not have a leading one, it's a free column, and the corresponding variable is called a free variable. And we're going to see in our, in our example, we call it a free variable because in the general solution to the system of equations, free variables can as be assigned any real number. They can have any value uh, you choose. Now, the row echelon form of a matrix is not unique. When we learn how to calculate the row echelon form from a general matrix, we're going to find that there's a lot of options, and uh, you know, three different people could come up with three different row echelon forms, which are all valid in, this, in, in a very useful sense. But when you get to the reduced row echelon form, that is unique, meaning that no matter what intermediate steps you take, in the end, you're going to get the exact same reduced row echelon form. So let's look at this uh, matrix here. It's already in row echelon form, and it could correspond to a uh, system of equations. There's going to be four equations, because we have four rows. And there's going to be five variables, x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, and then the right-hand side. Now notice that there is a leading one in column one. In column two, there's no leading one. Column three has a leading one. Column four has no leading one. Right, remember, a leading one means that every number to the right of that one, I'm sorry, to the left of that one, every number to the left of the one in that row is a zero. In other words, the one is the first non-zero entry as you go from left to right. So column four does not have a leading one. Column five does have a leading one. And this represents the right-hand side. Uh, so you don't expect it to have a uh, leading one there. Which tells us that the leading variables are x1, x3, and x5, because those are the columns with leading ones. x2, I mean, sorry, column 2 and column 4 do not have leading ones. So that tells me that x2 and x4 are free variables. Now let's see if we can write down the solution. Now because x2 and x4 can assume uh, any or can be assigned any real number, uh, we show that by assigning a parameter. So we're going to get a parameterized solution to this system of equations. And so there's going to be two parameters, t and r. t is going to correspond to x sub 2, and x sub 4 uh, is going to have the parameter r assigned to it. And now let's use our back substitution. So uh, row 4 is just a 0 equals 0, so uh, 
it's there. It's a true statement, which is important that it's a true statement. Um, but uh, it doesn't help us find the solution. But from row 3, this is saying x5, 1x5 equals 3. Now let's go to row 2. This would be, let's see, that's x5, x4, x3 minus x4 plus 2x5 equals 7. Well, x4 can be any value, so we're going to assign it the parameter r. So we replace x4 with r. x5, we know it equals 3. It has that fixed value, 3. So let's go ahead and substitute that in, and then solve for x3. So x3 equals r plus 1. So we get a parametric equation for x3. Now let's go to the first row. Again, this is 1x1 plus 2x2 plus 1x3 plus 1x4 minus 4x5 equals negative 8. So we make our substitutions. We'll replace the uh, x5 with 3. So that's how I get the minus 12 here. I replace the x4 with r. I replace uh, x3 with its parametric solution, r plus 1. I replace x2 with the parameter t. And then perform the algebra collecting like terms, solving for x1. And I get x1 equals negative 2t minus 2r plus 3. So in this system, only x5 has a fixed value of 3. The remaining variables have parametric solutions. And so we could write those parametric solutions or condense them into a vector. So we would say that the vector x1, x2, x3, x4 is going to have components or parametric components 3 minus 2t minus 2r, that's for x1. t corresponds to x2. 1 plus r is x3. The parameter r represents x4. And then only x5 has that fixed value of 3. Now, a more useful and, in fact, more familiar way, if you think about it, is if I, instead of writing the right-hand side as one vector, let's write it as three vectors. There's going to be one vector for all the constants in each component. So in the first component, I have a constant of 3. In the second component, there's no constant, so I need a placeholder 0. In the third component, the constant is 1. In the fourth component, no constant value, so I put a placeholder 0. And then the fifth component, I have a constant, which is 3. And then the second vector is going to have all the coefficients on r. So in the first component, I have a negative 2r. In the second component, there is no r term, so I need to put a placeholder 0. In the third component, I have 1r, so I put a 1 here. In the fourth component, I have 1r, so I put a 1, that's the coefficient. And in the fifth component, there's no r term, so I just have a placeholder 0. And then finally, the third vector represents the components on t, at the parameter t. So in the first of the components, the coefficients on the co parameter t. And so in the first component, I have a negative 2t, so I'll put in a negative 2. In the second component, I have 1t, so I'll put a 1. And in the remaining components, there are no t terms, so I just need placeholder zeros. So this should actually remind us of the vector equation of a plane. Uh, that's, this is exactly the same form. We had this kind of, an, we called it their initial vector. And then these were the two vectors which were parallel to the plane. So now this is in four space, so there's not really uh, 
a, a geometric object. Um, there is this notion of a hyperplane, but a hyperplane always has uh, a dimension which is one less than the space that it's in. So a plane in R3 is a two-dimensional object. A hyperplane in R4 uh, would be a three-dimensional object. Uh, but here I have this uh, plane be or this object, this uh, set in R4 being generated by two vectors, two parameters, two vectors. So it doesn't really have a name, but it looks very much like it. And this, if we think about this, this particular, again, let's think about this, right? That uh, this is the most general solution to the system of equations that we started out with. And we can choose any value for r and any value for t and that will give me a solution to the system of equations. Well, clearly, the simplest solution would be choosing r and t equaling to 0. And in that case, I would get a particular solution, which consists of just the constant vector at that point. So we know that if we have a system in rho echelon form, that we can find the solution to the system of equations uh, rather easily. So our next step, and what we'll see in the next video, is how do we go from a general system or a general augmented matrix to a matrix which is in row echelon form or in reduced row echelon form?